Hello, hello, pleasant. Good day, one and all. Uh, welcome again to Structure and Function of the Human Body, Part 2. And today we will be looking at Chapter 13, a very important organ, the heart. Very important. And it's my pleasure to actually present to you. So in terms of the flow of the work, we will be looking at it from this angle. We compare and contrast the pulmonary versus systemic circulation, map the structure and function of the heart, state the function of the heart, describe the location of the human heart, describe the layers, trace the blood flow, describe circulation through the myocardium. It's very important to note that is actually the heart muscle, so we'll be looking at that. Describe the events of the cardiac cycle in terms of the diastole and systole, squeezing and release, where you have filling of the blood in the heart itself. The examine and explain an ECG, that PQRST wave, we'll have a little talk about that. Define cardiac output and describe the equations. Um, and explain autonomic nervous system control as it relates to heartbeat. Right. We'd also mention briefly the Frank Starling law and look at different ways in terms of describing variations in heart rate. And to wrap it all up, we'd give an example of factors that may give rise to variation in the heart rate. So very importantly, in terms of circulation within the heart itself, it's a continuous one-way circuit of blood vessels and it of course is propelled by the heart itself. In terms of the location of the heart, the heart is located between the lungs, left of the midline of the body, in the region known as the mediastinum, with the apex or the tip or pointy part of the heart always pointing toward the left. It's always important anatomically to distinguish this particular function because this is a very important means of knowing which, where it is, uh, which side is the left and right anatomically. So it's always important to look in terms of a marker to look at the apex, look for the apex, the apex of the heart is always pointed to the left. So therefore anatomically you will know what side is the left side and which side the right side. Let's have a look at this. So here it is, we are looking at in the thorax anterior view. Here we are seeing the heart and again the apex pointed towards the left. So if we were to draw a line down the uh, center of the torso, we know that this area on the, or this side is the left as relates to the lung, as it relates as well to other structures found within it. Very important to note also, the heart is surrounded by a pericardium. That word peri, for those of us who would remember our mathematics days, right? Well, we have the perimeter. Peri, of course, prefix meaning around. So the pericardium, it's a fluid full sac. Very important because it reduces friction between the heart and the lungs and surrounding structures. So if it weren't for the, if the pericardium was not present, you would have increased function, which could compromise the very structure of the heart itself. And of course, down here we see the diaphragm, the most important muscle associated with breathing, this diaphragm. So we'll look at that in a little more detail when you look at respiration. All right. So the structure of the heart consists of three major layers, the myocardium, or the muscle of the heart, the endocardium, which is a layer that lines the heart's interior, and the epicardium is a thin outermost layer. Let's see how that looks. We'll speak more to it in just a little bit. But the peri, that sac that encloses the heart, it consists of a membrane and different layers associated with it. So let's look at those layers associated with the heart. Endocardium. So this is the layer of the heart that is most intimate with the blood that flows through the heart. The myocardium, this is the muscle of the heart itself. And the epicardium is the outermost layer. This, of course, is most intimate with the parietal um, pericardium. Very important uh, to take note of that. So this epicardium, here it is, and here is the pericardium. So these are in structures, the parietal pericardium is very close as it relates to this structure there. All right, which layer of the heart is the muscle? Anytime you hear muscle, of course, the prefix myo comes to mind. So myocardium, very good. So what are the special features of the myocardium? 
Well, in general, cardiac muscles, they are less striated or striped. They have a single nuclear cells. They are controlled in voluntary because we could well imagine it would be a little bit tricky if we were to fall asleep during, or when we do fall asleep or go to bed at night, if it was under voluntary control. Well, from the time we fall asleep, shortly thereafter, we would be talking with the ancestors. So it's very important that the beating of the heart is controlled by um, an involuntary mechanism because in that way it is keeps the uh, keeps us alive while we are sleeping. Um, the myocardium also has intercalated discs. These intercalated discs very important in terms of conducting the electrical activity associated with the heart, and they also have branch muscle fibers. So this is the structure of the heart, and in terms, you can see the striations or stripes, and most noticeably, you see darker striations. And this is usually the hallmark in terms of recognition of cardiac tissue, differentiating it from other types of tissue, the presence of these intercalated discs. So the divisions of the heart itself. The heart, in essence, is really a double pump. It has a right and a left side. The right side pumps the blood low in oxygen to the lungs, and of course, this low oxygenated blood has to pick up oxygen. So it goes to the lungs, and of course, the term associated with lung function, pulmonary. So therefore, the pulmonary circuit refers to this movement of blood from deoxygenated blood or low oxygenated blood, um, moving it from uh, the heart over to the lungs and returning it back to the heart. The left side, of course, when this oxygenated blood is returned, now it has to go into the systemic circuit or throughout the body, and the left side is associated with it. Right side, lungs, left side, whole body, systemic and pulmonary. So Let's talk about the chambers. So structurally, the heart has four chambers. The receiving chambers are known as the atrium. Very similar to, of course, the, the term for those of us who go to hotels, or you would see that the welcoming area where you would have that person behind the desk, that's the atrium. Hello, may I help you, sir? Welcome to blah, blah, blah hotel, you know? So that desk or welcoming area, that's the atrium. And similarly, when you look at the heart, you have both a right and a left atrium, and this is the areas that receive the blood. The others, of course, are the ventricles. Atria above ventricles, they are below. And the ventricles are usually the pumping, they're associated with pumping. The ventricles pumping, atrium reception. And this is just showing that which I just spoke to in terms of the atria. Here you have the left and right atria. The um, right atria receiving blood from the inferior and superior vena cavas, so-called because of their location in terms of receiving blood from above regions above the heart, that's the superior, and the region below the level of the heart is returned by the inferior. Comes into the right atria, right ventricle, who now it needs to move to the lungs. They do that by the left pulmonary artery, and they go, and they do get oxygenated and returned. I know what you're saying, Hello, we are seeing that we, it breaks into two. We have a left pulmonary artery and a right one. So why does this occur? Well, it occurs because we have a left and a right lung. So that is important to take note. A bifurcation or a splitting of the pulmonary artery in order that the oxygenated blood could go to both left and right lungs. Of course, they are returned by the left and right pulmonary veins to the receiving area on the left side, left atrium. It then goes to the left ventricle and is then pumped via the systemic circulation throughout the body via the aorta, that main artery that carries the blood throughout the entire body. All right, so this is just showing, it's diagrammatically the major um, structures associated with the heart, which I just went through, and you will be well placed to follow the flow of blood through the heart. Right, so blood come, enters by the superior and inferior vena cavas into, as we mentioned before, into the right atrium. From the right atria, it goes through the tricuspid valve, and then, of course, it needs to go to the lungs to get oxygenated. You will notice here that the hue of the blood is blue and red, which often brings one to the question, is blood ever blue? All 
right? Some people might be saying, well, yes, if you look at your wrist, you will see blueness or certain green tinge associated with the blood. That is just a product of the blood being seen through your, the walls of the veins and also through your skin. But in actuality, blood is really never blue. The only reason why they actually give this blue hue to it in this cartoon is just to tell the difference between deoxygenated and oxygenated so that visually you can have a representation of deoxygenated blood and its flow through the heart and by extension you can diagrammatically see the return of blood that is oxygenated so that's why it is given a reddish tinge this one is blue but in actuality blood is never blue blood is always red and shades of red yes all right which shape of the heart receives so in terms of receiving, it has to be an atrium. So which one is it? Is it a right atrium or the left atrium? Well, it has to be the, in this case, the left atrium. Very good. So the valves. You mentioned atria, receiving the blood. Uh, the ventricles pump it either to the lungs or through the, which is the pulmonary circuit, or through the body itself, systemic circuit. So how, what are, how does it do that? Well, in terms of the valves associated with these um, two parts, the linking the atria and the ventricle, you have the right AV valve, also known as the tricuspid, and the left AV bicuspid, because it has three parts, this one has two, hence the names. And then, of course, the semilunar valves, which are the exit valves, you have the pulmonary valve, in terms of the one that goes to the lung, and then the aortic valve, that's the one that goes into the systemic circulation. And this is shown here in terms of the location of those different valves. All right, so this is the flow of blood, which I just mentioned in terms of it entering by, from the systemic circulation superior by the superior and inferior vena cava into the atria, the right atria. From the right atria, it flows uh, through the valves and it goes now to, into the pulmonary, very important pulmonary uh, circuit to get oxygenation. It is returned via the pulmonary vein, right and left pulmonary vein. It then enters the left atria. From the left atria, it goes to the vent and then of course it leaves via the major artery of the heart, the aorta. All right, what is the purpose of valves in the heart? All right, prevent the backflow, very important, right? Keep things moving in one direction. Okay, so blood supply to the myocardium. We're looking, we looked previously at the flow of blood through the heart. And of course, this supplies uh, blood, which is very important in terms of the nutrient content it carries, oxygen, of course, and also nutrients to the different cells. But what about the heart itself, the heart muscle? That needs nutrients as well. So how does, how does the heart muscle, in particular the myocardium, which is the thickest layer um, of the heart muscle, how does it get um, this blood supply? And this occurs via the coronary circulation. Coronary, so-called, because coronary refers to a crown, right? So coronary circulation, when you do look at it, it forms a crown around the heart, hence the name. So the coronary circulation consists of the right and left coronary artery and the coronary sinus. This sinus is a collection of veins joined together to form this large vessel that collects the blood from the heart muscle itself. Let's see how that looks diagrammatically. So here we see the coronary artery, very important in terms of bringing the blood, and coronary vein, and of course joining them is this coronary sinus, where the blood um, moves between these two aforementioned structures. All right. We look at the heart, we look at the structures, we look at the movement of blood through the heart. Now let's talk about the functions of the heart. Of course, pumping action, that is critical, both to the lung and to the system itself, the systemic circulation. Now, the left and right sides of the heart work together in a cardiac cycle, which is known as the heartbeat. You have a systole, which is an active phase and involves contraction or squeezing, and then you have the diastole, which is the resting phase. So very and to take note, in terms of the cardiac cycle, you have the diastole, atrial systole, or the squeezing of the atria, and then ventricular systole. So these three things here, they make up the cardiac cycle. 
So, in terms of measurement of effectiveness of heart functioning, you do have these equations which are used to measure them. And they are known as cardiac output, stroke volume, heart rate, and very interestingly, in terms of linking them, the cardiac output is a measure of the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. So, in terms of cardiac output, very important to take note of this mathematical calculation, which can be used comparatively to tell if the heart is functioning well or not. Heartbeat. So we often wonder, fair enough, the heart beats within our chest, but how? what tells it to actually contract? And this is where the conduction system or the electrical system associated with the heart comes into play. So the electrical energy stimulates the heart muscle. One must remember, if you were to go back to our uh, memory, go through our memory as it relates to con uh, contraction of muscle. Once muscle is presented with an electrical stimulus, it contracts. Once it removed, that stimulus is removed, it relaxes. So very importantly, as it relates to the heart, electrical conduction, uh, when electrical conduction flows to the heart, you do have contraction. And of course, what is most important is that you have a rhythmic contraction, because if the rhythmic contraction Contraction does not occur. If all of the cells, um, the cardiac cells, contract at the same time, what you'll have happening is fibrillation or the heart quivering like jello on a plate and you are shaking the plate. So it just quivers. Right? So, very importantly, the conduction system it supplies an electrical stimulus to all of the cells at the same time or it facilitates that um, occur occurrence. When that happens, of course, you have a nice, clean, rhythmic beat. So the nodes, in terms of the breakdown of the conduction system, you have the SA node, sinoatrial node, which is known as the pacemaker, the AV node, atrio atrioventricular node, which is secondary to the sinoatrial in terms of maintenance of that pacemaking ability. Then you have the bundle of his and conduct Purkinje fibers, and finally the intercalated his. So in terms of the pathway, the rhythm is initiated in the SA node. Right, it goes to the atria, then to the AV node, via the internodal pathways, bundle of his, the branches, and ultimately then to the ventricles. It's very important that this electrical conducting system reaches all the path, parts or cells associated with the cardiac tissue. And to facilitate this, or, and to facilitate this um, happening, this is how you have this conduction system, which, um, which occurs as is shown here. So the heart rate itself, how is it controlled? Well, the heart rate is controlled via the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for controlling many of the physiological functions and inducing the force of contraction of the heart. Very important in terms of facilitating these things. The um, autonomic nervous system has both sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system via the postganglionic fibers from the sympathetic trunk and the parasympathetic system is via cranial nerve number 10. So here we see in terms of the sympathetic which speeds up the um, heart rate, right, is via the sympathetic nerve in terms of the vagus nerve under parasympathetic control, this is what slows down the heart rate. All right, so almost there. So one of these things um, which we need to uh, take note of in terms of variation in heart rates, bradycardia and tachycardia. All right, so tachycardia refers to the speeding up of the heart, bradycardia slowing down or slow heart rate, arrhythmias and a normal beat, and of course extra systole, this is a premature beat associated with the heart itself. All right, so what is the medical term for a heart rate of more than 100 beats, which is and of course, that is tachycardia. Heart is beating rather quickly. The last thing we'd want to mention in terms of a relationship of the heart itself is the so-called Frank-Starling law of the heart. And what this states is that um, it represents this relationship between stroke volume and the end diastolic volume. And the law states that the stroke volume of the heart increases in response to an increase in the volume of blood. More blood in the heart, the heart beats faster. That is what it translates to. And that very important relationship is known as the Frank Starling law of.
the heart. Of course, in terms of measurement of heart activity, this could be done by examination of a normal ECG tracing. And what this shows, atrial depolarization, ventricular repolarization, right? So this is just a measure of the electrical activity, also known as the PQRST wave. And depending on the form of the wave itself, a trained physician or somebody within the field, they could tell if there are any defects associated with parts of the heart due to the fact that the PQRST wave is out of sync or looks um, a little different from that which is expected. All right, so that represents the uh, lecture on the heart. I hope, do hope it was informative and do have a great day. Have a good one. Bye-bye.